Hey everyone. Um, everything I'm gonna share to, with you today, um, we as an organization, which primarily is an advocacy organization, fell into, in many ways, um, by accident. <laughs> and we're doing it as we go. Um, so when I say that we are having a digital response to a growing need, it is in fact trying for ourselves to discover a digital response for our own growing need that we are finding. Um, this all started for us when we um, put up mhascreening.org. So historically over the years, MHA as an organization has been fighting for early identification and intervention of mental health problems. And we've worked with different organizations to put to fight for, for early screening programs. And then in 2014, we decided to kind of bring this all in house and hosted um, at least only four screens at that time, depression, anxiety, bipolar, and the PTSD screen. Kind of threw it out on the internet, not knowing what we we're gonna get. And through the process, um, found that a lot of people wanted to come to Google <laughs> to look up um, their mental health problems. And so over time, we then added a youth screen, because we found out that many people were young, a parent screen, an alcohol substance use screen, a psychosis screen, added two Spanish language screens, and then an eating disorder screen. So over time, we've just kind of built this, built this program. And ultimately, um, what we have today um, over the past couple of years is that we have a data set of about 2.6 million people who have come online to take one of our mental health screens. And this has helped us to learn some things that have um, moved the way that we've been thinking about the use of technology and how to, to deal with what we're seeing, right? So I'm gonna share with you first a little bit of what we're seeing and then talk a little bit about what we think can be a solution, but ultimately open up maybe many more questions than we have solutions. Um, what we know from screeners is that it's primarily a help-seeking population. So people are online and they're struggling with mental health problems, and by the time they come to Google something like, am I depressed or stressed, or a depression test, most of them don't type depression screen, they come and they take a screen, and most of our screeners are scoring positive. And if you look at the, the linear trajectory, it's, it's people are screening severe, more likely than they're screening mild on the PHQ-9, right? Um, among those who score positive, 65% report that they have never been diagnosed. And we see this as part of their typed responses as well. They're saying, I don't know what to do, like, can you help me? I don't even know where to get started. Um, Looking at some of the demographic data, we asked people to give us voluntary demographic data. Um, we were surprised that 8% of our screeners were international, um, with big cohorts from Europe, Canada, and Australia, although we have recently, in the last six months, had requests from Nigeria, Uzbekistan, <laughs> areas of the globe where they're asking for help and they wanna use screening tools because they see it as a valuable thing, but they really don't know how to get started. So clearly a demand globally. Um, our ethnic breakdown is close to census, and although from an age demographic, it clearly skews young. And for us, this is huge implications on early treatment, because what we're seeing is that young, young kids are coming on to take a screen. And in the early year of screening, we put it up and told people, like, only take the screen if you're an adult. You know, we kind of really worried about ethics and privacy. But we found that young children were coming online anyways, and at the end, they'd type in, I'm 13, I'm 15, you know, you need to tell me what I can do, I don't know what to do, I wanna talk to my parents. You know, we saw time and time again this kind of response come up. So, in 2015, when we put up age, actually found out really what was happening underneath, and 36% 36, 36 of our screeners are 11 to 17 and then 29% are 18 to 24. And this is really a key time, right? If we think about early intervention and identification and when we can intervene to really change that trajectory as many of us hope to do for serious mental health problems, this is, this is a key time we wanna do that. Interestingly enough, 30% also report other comorbid mental health problems including chronic pain, lung problems, diabetes. We're still trying to understand what this data means. Um, because I realized that people here liked data. <laughs> I, 
I decided to put in a couple of slides. John's super happy back there. <laughs> um, there's no way I probably can go through each of these, but what I want to just hit on are some things that we thought were interesting as a group. Um, we asked if people were new or expecting mothers because so many people were screening for depression. And we're like, oh, maybe something's going on with perinatal mental health. Well, um, not necessarily. There weren't, there weren't necessarily many, many mothers who were taking our screen, but among the moms who were taking our screen, the thing that was most interesting is those who identified as new or expecting mothers were most interested in finding treatment right after. So the most likely to engage in some kind of activation after taking a screen, as compared to other groups. Another hot population for us when we started to look in the data was our LGBTQ population. Um, Nationally, about 3% of the U.S. identifies as LGBTQ. Among our screeners, 30% of those who provide us some kind of demographic information about their special population identity identify as LGBTQ. And many of them are scoring severely higher, or scoring higher on scales than our, our normal population. But what was interesting about this population, which we're taking a special look at, are some of the findings that I have here. Um, and most concerning is that they're less likely to talk to somebody um, or, or feel like they can and less ready maybe to look for treatment. And maybe this says something about how they personally feel they have access maybe to supports that meet their unique needs in our community. Another interesting population for us um, is the millennial group. Um, just this growing people who are possibly in a transition um, into adulthood and maybe vulnerable um, to onset of maybe more se severe mental health problems. Um, also a very large cohort for us. Um, what was, you know, we're kind of looking into it and many of them are more likely to screen for depression. Um, we're certainly keeping an eye on the depression data nationwide from an epidemiological perspective given that some indication that since the ubiquitous use of smartphones, we know that there's more depression and more suicidal ideation among our young people. So um, what does this mean? How might we see that reflected in, in the people that are turning to the internet for help, right? And we have a couple of word clouds. Um, for MHA with our limited resources, <laughs> We don't have the technology to do really great natural language processing analysis, so this is the best we have. Um, we threw all the words, the texts from different cohorts into like a word cloud generator, and this is of our millennial group, which the general group all says that they want help, but I think the millennial one was particularly interesting from a perspective of seeing words like, um, I just want to know what's going on, right? Um, online is a word that we don't see in other groups, but we see among our younger people. Um, and certainly this is a reflection of our overall data set because the millennials make up the largest cohort in our data. So people are coming online and we're trying to figure out what we wanna do, but we ask people, you know, what do you think you're gonna do next after you take a screen? And I guess we not, we're not really that surprised that 30% tell us to go away. <laughs> um, it's, um, it was validation that we're really dealing with a group of people who are ambivalent. There's a lot of need, but people don't really know what they can do next, and they might not want to do anything. And for us, the big question about looking at a number, like one out of three says, I'm not gonna do anything at all, is for us the big next question is how can I move that person if I know that they're not gonna do anything incrementally to some next step to move them somewhere. Interestingly, when we look at people who answer these questions and then I track their behaviors on the internet afterwards, that we do find that, and I have to do the data analysis, that some of the people who actually say they're gonna do nothing or even more aggressively tell us to go away, spend more time <laughs> reading content on our website than the cohorts who don't say anything at all or say they might even talk to somebody or read other stuff, right? I don't know why that happens, but it's something that we're kind of interested in. Um, 
So our, our, our next step, our concern, our, what we're trying to figure out is really what to do, right? We're trying to create a program called screening to support. That's what we call it internally. And it's really a, react, it, it, a reaction or a response to what we see as our growing need. The large number of people are coming online to our screening program. And because they're ambivalent, it also isn't, um, it, it's, it makes sense that people are really just looking for information. They want things they can use at home, right? There was a debate in our office. People thought for sure people would want a phone number immediately to call somebody and others who were younger were like, no way. Like, Nobody's gonna wanna call anybody like a warm line. And so we just said, well, let's just throw out and ask the question, and this is what we got back. And people were allowed to click as many answers as they wanted, and you know, of the people who answered this question, 50% 50 50 said they wanted information, do things at home, or maybe an online or mobile program. Um, there's a debate as I talk to people who are mobile app, you know, researchers in the community, like we all know that people think they want something, but when they're given the tools, they don't really use them. And we don't really have technology that does a good job about creating things that work, right? So I think there's some taking things with a grain of salt when we, we, when we see that people want a mo mobile or online tool. I think a big question is like, what kind of tool and are we really meeting the needs of the community to find and develop things that are usable? And so what we're looking to do is in, in some essence create a lab, an online lab where if I can siphon screeners, one or some number of my almost 3,000 people who come every day to take a screen and based on their results, based on the type of screen they take, based on the severity, where they live maybe, or other factors like comorbid morbid health problems, identifying as LGBT, female, male, whatever it is that might work, can I find and create tools that are dynamically, um, we, like using algorithms so that we selectively lend them to like certain types of tools to see what they might pick up and ultimately create an online lab where if we can experiment on what incremental change I can get someone to use or pick up, can I start to think about how technology can fill a space to reduce that duration of untreated mental health when people are just sitting at home and quite ambivalent about going into a clinic ever? For us, that's the beginning of the question. We've only just built out the framework for the platform, talking to researchers across the country who have um, projects that they're looking at, and subjects that they would like to see who might experiment with things like this. Like we're really just starting to explore what the opportunities are that exist in this space. But since this is an ethics and privacy uh, panel, what I wanted to do was just share with you some of the questions that we often get, given that we are screening, you know, 3,000 people every day. These questions come from community members, um, providers in the community and sometimes our own board members, you know, who are really pushing us to think. Um, the most often question we get is how, when you're thinking about being so far off somewhere in the internet, how do you, how do you deal, don't you worry about people who are suicidal and you're a liability for taking care of them, especially because we have so many children. And for me personally, when I see the data and I see how many kids are out there, the, the response is that I don't have influence on these kids. They're going to struggle with suicidal thoughts and thoughts of cutting with or without me. But as an organization, we have a decision to provide support or not, and it doesn't feel right to not provide support, right? When you frame it that way, that we are otherwise leaving young children to struggle without good information, which we know does not exist on the internet, then it's only the case that the responsible action to take is to try and fill that gap. Um, the next two questions I think are often intertwined. And it's, it's this feeling that like, we're doing this thing online and people have questions about the word DIY, like do it yourself. This is a term of art that is familiar for people, non-clinicians, everyday people that they understand, but something about that term or something about saying, you know what, we're gonna democratize healthcare and take everything out of the clinic and put it into the internet 
really freaks some people out. <laughs> but at the same token, when I look at the data again, this is the kind of support that people are saying they want. And right now, when I force someone to have to walk into a clinic or to call a warn line, I'm not really meeting people where, where they're at. And we're not thinking innovatively or translating the things that we know that work to create welcoming, welcoming environments to help bring people into a new space where they can access the kind of care that they want or need at a very specific time, right? And then privacy. I mean, somebody said it earlier, and I think the only way that, to do that right is transparency and to write things in plain language. I mean, th that's just a battle. Like, so, so many <laughs> it, you can have a lot of legalese, and yes, there's cover your ass, and you know, you put your disclaimer at the top and say X, Y, or Z. Um, for us, we've kind of we're at a cusp right now of whether or not that's gonna be difficult because for us, everything has been anonymous and confidential, but with screening supports, we're gonna ask people to sign up, give us information. We might follow people. We have a couple research projects where people are signing into something that feels much more invasive. Um, so we'll have to deal with this a little more. Transparency, let people decide. Educating people about what they share, how they share it. You know, taking a consumer-friendly approach. Those are the things that we hope will make a difference. And ultimately, everything that we do is driven by this, um, and it's where I'll end. You know, it's what is our responsibility to meet a demand, a large demand, a global demand in a severely under-resourced environment, and increasingly so given our political environment. And when I say think innovatively, again, it's tied to that question, questioning our bias towards traditional care. So what does care look like in the future, right? Right now, um, how do I think about what works and what's sticky? Like relationships, interconnectedness, vulnerability, reconciliation. These are the things I know that matter to people, but they don't translate into CBT or like clinics. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, let alone how do I do that in a digital space? Um, I don't know what the answers are, but I, I think that's what's exciting about what, what that possibility is. And then ultimately, do something. So when you ask questions about, is it right to serve young children, X, Y, or Z, I'd say when you look at the internet and you see things like ProAnna and ProAmi sites and the scary things that I find on the website, those people, they target our youth way more effectively than we are. And that to me is the scariest thing about our responsibility to do something and to create tools that help to mirror and counteract what otherwise is teaching our children to be, become more effective cutters and who knows what, right? So in a world where we don't know what works, anything's possible, <laughs> this is what I hope. That's it, thanks.